What do tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, and potatoes have in common with one of the most poisonous plants known to man? Well, their family. Guten gardening, everybody. Well, today I think I have a fascinating video lined up for you because we're going to be diving into the Solanaceae family, the nightshade family, and we're gonna be talking about how some of the nightshade plants are so poisonous, but we've got all of these amazing vegetables that we love to grow. Some of them, some of the most important vegetables in our garden, they're all part of the same family, but these, for the most part, are safe to eat. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how that came to be, and we're gonna focus in on some of the elements of the nightshade vegetables that are so important to understand. So let's get started by talking a little bit about the poisonous side of things with deadly nightshade. The first thing I wanna do in this video is to meet the nightshades a little bit more closely, because I think we can identify probably the deadly nightshade as one part of the nightshade family that we have heard of, that we've heard rumors about in terms of just how poisonous it is, and the fact that for a period of time at least, people used deadly nightshade for something a little bit surprising. You know, one of the cool things about doing research for a video like this is you learn statistics or facts that you had no idea of before. For example, the nightshade, the deadly nightshade, is called the belladonna. And there was some speculation how in the Victorian time period, people would use nightshade or the deadly nightshade as a form of makeup. Now, from the research that I gathered, and this research is based on somebody else's reading of a Latin text from the 1700s, apparently the primary use for makeup was to cover reddening or swelling in the face. And a secondary unintended consequence seems to be the dilation of the pupils. So I think there was some speculation going around that perhaps the deadly nightshade was actually used to dilate pupils, but it sounds more like that was an unintended consequence and not something that people were looking to do. But rather, people use this deadly toxin to try to cover up the red on their faces. Again, you learn something new every day. Now the deadly nightshade is one of the most toxic plants, but there are other toxic members of the Solanaceae family, including mandrake and tobacco, each of which are toxic in their own way. So one of the questions we wanna answer is how we got from those toxic members of the family to edible plants that for most of us aren't going to cause us any problems at all. Now I think to understand this family a little bit better, I have to introduce a concept here and that is the concept of poisonous alkaloids. And so the first thing I wanna do is to try to define alkaloids in a simple way. And I think the easiest way to define alkaloids for our sake today is just that they are nitrogen containing compounds that can have an effect on people. Sometimes there are positive effects, sometimes there are negative effects, but the purpose of those alkaloids as far as plants goes is to create a natural sort of pesticide against some of the herbivores out there. Think about it this way. We see the evidence of alkaloids through the chlorophyll that greens up potatoes when they're exposed to the sunlight. And when they're exposed to the sunlight, what happens? That's when they're exposed to animals. And so as a defense mechanism to keep animals from coming along and eating them, you see that solanine production, which is the alkaloid production to try to prevent, it's like a natural pesticide. I think that's the easiest way to say it. Well, deadly nightshade's weapon of choice is called atropine. And so if you consume atropine, you have potential effects on the nervous system, you could be hallucinating, you could be paralyzed, you could even die from consuming too much of that atropine, which is one of the things that makes it so dangerous. Well, the edible nightshades contain alkaloids as well. Potatoes, as I mentioned, contain solanine. Eggplants also contain some level of solanine. And for both of those, the solanine appears in higher concentrates when exposed to the sun, in the case of potatoes, uh, around the eyes of the potatoes, the flowers, the stems of the eggplants and potatoes all contain higher concentrations, which is one of the reasons why we don't eat the actual stems or plants, because that could cause some pretty serious problems. 
Tomatoes contain something called tomatine. But interestingly, the tomatine in tomatoes is actually converted away from that harmful alkaloid as the tomato ripens. And so we don't have to worry about that so much. And actually to see a reduction in tomatine, you allow the tomatoes to ripen. Now, I have to say that even though there's solanine and tomatine in these different vegetables that I'm talking about so far, the levels in our food for the most part are too low to harm us unless you're really munching in on some of those green potatoes. Now there is an interesting story about that exact thing. According to an article from the Smithsonian Magazine, and I actually saw this in a couple of other places as well, in 1979, 78 schoolboys and several other adults fell ill after consuming a bag of potatoes that had been left in storage from the previous summer term. Those potatoes apparently had greened up and had such high levels of solanine in them that for within four to 14 hours, the boys were having quite a few symptoms, some of which I won't mention, but interestingly enough, within about five days, the fever that they had dealt with, some had dealt with being comatose, some twitching, paralysis, within about five days, all of the patients had fully recovered. But there is the possibility then, and there are plenty of other stories out there, by the way, but there is the possibility then for these high levels of solanine, if we don't take proper care, to create some pretty big impacts. So how is it possible we're at a place where most of these vegetables, when stored properly, are not going to actually create some of these problems for us? And I think part of the way in which we have helped to make nightshades, some of the nightshades safe to eat, is through selective breeding. You know, alkaloid levels, the higher alkaloid levels tend to be bitter, tend to have a pretty bad taste. And over generations, this process of choosing these lower alkaloid level plants, these breeding, selective breeding of plants has made them safer and tastier. You know, wild tomatoes are a good example. They were smaller, they were bitter, and now we're at a point where we have hundreds of larger sweet varieties through that selective breeding process. That being said, people for a long time mistrusted nightshades. And I have a really good example of that when it comes to tomatoes. You know what, sometimes you hear something that you believe to be true, it makes perfect sense to you, and you share that information only to find out later on that it probably wasn't the case. So a good example of that is the tomato. So we understand that tomatoes are a part of the nightshade family, but the rationale or the reason why so many people believed that tomatoes were poisonous wasn't necessarily because of the nightshade element. It was actually because of the plates that the tomatoes were served on, that they were soaking up or taking in some of the lead, which was making people sick. And so for a long time, people didn't want to. Actually, up until the late 19th century here in the US, people weren't really interested in eating tomatoes. Now, what I believed to be the case, because I had heard it at one time, but which apparently is not the case, you know, back in Shakespeare's day, there, tomatoes weren't really that prevalent, but I had heard that people were throwing tomatoes at the actors and that because the actors thought that the tomatoes were poisonous, they'd be dodging the tomatoes. And I had heard that that was one of the original reasons why they sold food at the theater in the first place was to throw things. Well, they did actually probably throw other things like figs, etc. but tomatoes weren't on the menu. Now, one thing of interest to me is that if you go and buy your potatoes, for example, from the grocery store, I think a lot of times you'll see a lot of the greening, I, I always call it solanine damage, but basically greening due to exposure to light, etc. that's still there in the store-bought potatoes. And so in my mind, one thing that we can do is to try to avoid that, which also helps to make it safer for us to consume this type of vegetable. And the same thing can be said for proper storing. If we can avoid the, the greening of potatoes, for example, then we have the ability to keep those solanine levels lower. Now I've talked about some of the problematic elements that come with alkaloids, but you gotta also remember, as I said earlier, the, there is a purpose to the alkaloids. For one, capsaicin in peppers, that's an alkaloid in peppers. Capsaicin is what provides different heat levels and it helps to deter mammals 
when it comes to their eating of the peppers, although birds don't taste the heat, so they can still help spread seeds, which is really nice. And we do enjoy, I'll say capsaicin can provide some uh, irritation, but we do enjoy that alkaloid, I think, when it comes to different levels of heat in our food, different flavors of peppers. Additionally, some of those alkaloids help plants resist not just pests, but also diseases. So it's not like we'd want to fully remove alkaloids from the plants themselves. I think about it as a sort of balance between the flavor of the plant, the nutritional potential positive impact, and the defense that the plant needs, the natural defenses of the plant. Now, I'm sure you're aware of this. We actually did a video on the potato berry, the poisonous potato berry, and how potato berries, which are formed on some potato plants, contain the true potato seed. But if you were to eat that potato berry, you would have a dangerous level of the alkaloid solanine. And so you would not want to consume that part of the plant, just like you wouldn't want to consume any of the stems of the potato plant. You wouldn't want to consume the leaves of the tomato plant or the flower of the eggplant or the stems of the eggplant. I didn't even know what that would taste like. I imagine it would be incredibly bitter, but those elements contain higher levels of the solanine and for tomatoes, the tomatine, which could definitely cause in some cases, nausea, maybe neurological issues, and almost certainly I would think would cause problems with digestion if you consume them in large enough quantities. So when it comes to these plants that I'm talking about today, we're focused on eating the fruits or the tubers. There we have the safe levels, but as far as the rest of the plant, we're gonna leave that completely alone. Now, as somebody who is a fan of fried green tomatoes, one of the questions that I had to ask myself as I looked through this video is how much of a decrease in things like tomatine or solanine are we seeing when we cook up vegetables? Because I think that's an important thing to note, especially for those of us who are a little bit more sensitive when it comes to the things that we eat. And what I've learned is that if you just search on the internet, does cooking really reduce levels of these sol the solanine, etc.? What you'll find is a variety of answers, but one of the studies that I looked into suggested that there's a small decrease anywhere from about 5% to as high from what I saw of 40%, but realistically, you shouldn't count on preparing, cooking, roasting, what have you, to really fix the problem once you're seeing an, an increase in solanine, for example, you don't necessarily want to rely on the, the cooking method or what have you to reduce those levels. Oh, well, by the way, this is an interesting potential side effect of tomatine though. Some suggest that the tomatine may have antifungal properties which helps the plant to stay healthy longer. I should also mention that when it comes to capsaicin, which is the alkaloid in peppers or in the hot varieties of peppers, is not considered to be toxic. And so it is technically an irritant, but it isn't one that affects the nervous system like solanine or the atropine that you see in the deadly nightshade. So that is probably a pretty important thing to note. Now that brings me to an important point in this video. Who should limit or maybe even avoid altogether some of these nightshade vegetables? Because I've talked about this that for most of us, you're not gonna have a problem if you're consuming these nightshade vegetables because of selective breeding, etc. We're at a point now where they should be okay for you. However, through my research, what I found is that some folks with autoimmune conditions, some, believe, some experts believe that the alkaloids and even the lectins in nightshades could exacerbate some of those symptoms. Folks with arthritis or joint issues, what I've read is that Alkaloids like solanine may actually contribute to inflammation in sensitive individuals, but I'm not 100% sure that that's correct. And those with allergies or sens specific sensitivities, maybe with digestive issues, for example, um, irritable bowel disease, etc., may want to avoid some of these as there's the possibilities for some mild allergic reactions from what I've read. And even infants and young children, maybe they're more sensitive, so you might want to be careful when it comes to giving them things like unripened tomatoes or undercooked eggplant. But realistically, if you think that there's the possibility that the nightshades might be having an effect on you, something like an elimination diet might actually be helpful to see if that's actually creating the problem for you. So I think I can sum all this video up in a few words by saying, 
I'm thankful that we've gotten to a point where these members of the Nightshade family are such a valuable and for the most part safe part of the gardening experience. I know that we would really be missing out if we couldn't have our tomatoes, our potatoes, especially our eggplant, our peppers and so on as a big part of the staples that come from our garden. Now we would love to hear from you on this topic. If you've had experience, maybe you've eaten some green potatoes and, and dealt with some of the consequences that came from that, or maybe you were a fan at one point of, of green tomatoes and that created a problem for you. We'd love to know more about it from the experiences of our community. One thing's for sure, we're gonna continue growing these nightshade vegetables, but as a part of the learning process, we're gonna take even more care when it comes to things like the preservation of our potatoes and making sure that we're doing our best to put as few of those toxins in our system as possible. Well, if you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to give us a like, leave us a comment, remember to share and subscribe, and most importantly, remember, when you're with us, you are good to grow.